On this episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show, we talk about some advice for becoming an amazing clinical instructor. The Ask Mike Reynolds Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Round Show. I am here with the crew, PTs, strength coaches, champion physical therapy and performance up in Boston. I am joined by Lisa Lowe, Mike Scaduto, Dave Tilly, Dwesh Podell, Dan Pope, Lenny Macrina, and our fabulous and amazing group of PT students here. Did you guys switch seats? Forget what happened. Or you just moved. You moved to the other side of the clinic. That's awesome. Good. Awesome. Well, good to see everybody back. Len, who do we have for students today? We have some lovely students, lovely students, and more. They'll be growing over the next few weeks, so good luck. We have Cody Adams from Franklin Pierce University in beautiful Arizona. I can't wait to go back there someday. I love Arizona. Uh, we have Brian Hunter from Hartford, Connecticut. We have Dean Bonneau from George Washington, our first student from G-Dubs. And we have Sean Bean from UNLV, University of Nevada nice. at Las Vegas. We have a lot from UNLV, right? Yeah, that's we got one every year. Yeah, uh, they're I guess pretty solid students. Lot. I guess that's not a lot. Yeah, I guess we just we just like them. So big shoes to fill, everyone. Uh, what do we have for a question today? Who's up? What's up, Brian? All right. So, yep, Michael from Chicago asks, what is your best advice for being a clinical instructor for a final rotation student? Awesome. Good Don't question, Michael. I, I like that. I've, we've actually received a few questions like this in the last six months or so. I like how Michael kind of put final rotation student. I, I, you know, that's something I don't think we probably put a lot of attention to is somebody that's literally going to be a PT like on Monday, <laughs> like when they're done with you, right? That's, it's a little different to think of it that way. Right. But, um, but I think this is pretty good. I don't think I'm the best clinical instructor in the world. So I'm going to let you guys kind of answer this a little bit. Um, and, and I don't know, I think we'll kind of, we can kind of build this here, but, um, I, I like this because I think we can, we can all do better job as being clinical instructors. Right. And this is something Lenny and I have been talking about at champion for like the last year. And I know Mike's put a lot of effort into like kind of reforming this with us a little bit. Um, you know, I think we do some things well, but I think we can always get better, but, um, I don't know. What do you think? What does it take to be an amazing clinical instructor who wants to start? I can begin, I guess, because I'm a, the official, what, I don't even know what the term is, ACCE, CCC, PD of champion. And so I, I do a gazillion CPIs every year. Um, I, I just think in my head, when I have a student come in, I'm going to assume they have a base of knowledge. They can measure with a goniometer. They can do manual muscle testing, all the stuff that the school requires you. So now it's up to me over eight, 10, hopefully 10 to 12 or 16 weeks would be perfect, the longer the better, that I can use those basic skills and have you apply it to the patients that are coming in and think in a more advanced and critical mindset that, because I know, like you said on Monday, so to speak, they will be independent and a PT themselves. I want them to begin to think in that fashion. So I am not uh, just breathing down their throats, watching every move they make, unless I see something really bad happening, which is not very common. It's more, I want them to think, I want, it's not going to be life-threatening if they make a mistake, but I also want them to think actively and have to kind of react to people and how people talk to them and how they talk to people and how people present and, and have to respond to all that. Uh, so I, my goal is to give them a ton of evals, critically think through it, let them kind of spread their wings a little and I'll kind of put nudge them along and kind of guide the process. And hopefully they can critically think through the process. And if not, I will help them critically think through the process and then help them with their notes as well. That's a big thing as well as I see some notes come through sometimes and it just doesn't capture everything. It has to capture everything that's going on in that session for that day. And so I'm just trying to help with that as well. Kind of a vague general response, but I think I want them to think independently versus me having to spoon feed them the information. 
Yeah, that's great, Len. I like how you divided it kind of into two things a little bit there. Like there's clinical reasoning and then there's <laughs> skill development. Right. So, you know, I know with our students, we spend a lot of time like going over to the side and practicing a skill or encouraging them to practice skills on each other all the time. That's different than clinical reasoning. So right. I think that that would be a good first thing if, if you're a new clinical instructor and maybe maybe you're having some imposter syndrome. <clears throat> for back what? to last episode, if you want to hear about how to right. deal with that, right? But maybe you're having some imposter syndrome as being a new CI with somebody, right? Like is think like, how do you help develop skills, but also clinical reasoning? Good stuff, Len. I like that. And um, I think also interacting with people is a huge thing. And so I, I always want, I would tell them and I try to tell them, watch how all of us, the seven PTs talk to their patients. There's a reason why I do everything I do in the, during the day. Like I am not doing cartwheels because I want to do a cartwheel in the middle of the day. I am not talking to somebody with chronic pain because I want to sit there and stare them in the eyes and, and listen to every word and try to help them interpret their pain. Like I, everything I do has a purpose for that particular person sitting in front of me because they have a journey and a story that's different from the person that just left me. And I need to try to read them, figure out the issues and try to interpret things a little bit better for them. So they are not fearful and everything else that, they are with their life so everything is so in my interactions with them also i want them to observe so before goof, goofballs hopefully you're doing that i lo- i like how you, but you you and all of us i think we also like tell the students that too and i think that's one thing as a clinical instructor too is like realize that a, a pt student is really bogged down probably with like minutiae they're like oh my god i don't remember how to do a right. lockman test right. Oh, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. but and they may miss that learning from your interaction with that patient yeah. that which was actually a really valuable thing so i actually right. like how we draw attention to that so that that was pretty good so, yeah um i saw a couple hands who wanted to to go next on that one uh mike i think i saw first yeah i think the communication aspect is is really one of the biggest things that i see that clinical students can improve uh on especially in their final rotation right so subjective history taking is such a huge part of what we do as clinicians Um, the patient will pretty much tell you or give you a pretty good idea of where to look in your clinical exam um, if you do a thorough and thoughtful subjective history. So it seems like clinical students typically come in and they have this list of questions. They go down the list one by one and they may not be tied together and it's kind of choppy and not very conversational. And I think as you gain experience, you start to make it more of a conversation with the patient with questions that follow up questions that kind of make sense based on what they said. And you're not just jumping from one topic to another because you have all these questions that you want to ask. So I think as when I work with a student, something that I've actually really tried to work on is not interrupting the student when they're doing a subjective and trying to butt in and like kind of guide the conversation. Um, I will if I need to, if I feel like it's, it's kind of gotten off track, but trying to let them explore how to turn the subjective history into more of a conversation, get comfortable talking in that manner um and trying to explore that on their own without me kind of interjecting all the time yeah that's great i like that i can uh, i can build off mics too because i feel as though obligated to share this people may not know this in podcasts but i actually failed a rotation and was kicked out of pt school and had a nightmare interaction with my ci <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, i like that i like you're sharing this because i i don't know we've had some really bad students i'm just kidding and it's just so hard to fail <laughs> uh, did, i mean did you injure a patient like what happened dave it was just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a long discussion and I own a lot of the accountability for it, but, uh, yeah, the CI interaction, me and her was not great. So let's just say that, um, <coughs> we had failed other students and no students went back after me. Let's just leave it at that. So <laughs> you know, it's something that I've taken away from that experience that I try to work with the students is I understand. And I completely understand. Uh, I think it's important, like Mike was saying, to let them kind of feel it out. But you have to understand the comfort level of the student to work in that environment, especially with more complex patients or more complicated situations, right? And so like we work in a very high level situation. Some people come to us with really, you know, high level sports or things they're going through. And sometimes you might start in a vow with someone or give someone a patient and start to realize quickly, like it's a lot more complicated maybe than like it's it's starting to lend on to be. So uh, I remember in one of my experiences, I got asked to do something very early in my clinical experience that I didn't consider injury level. It was like a very complicated patient who was like literally in the ICU and it was really, really overwhelming. And I straight up told my CI, I was like, listen, I'm, I'm trying my best here, but I don't feel comfortable. And she literally just let me fry. She was like, figure it out. You know, like, like, let's, let's work through this. And I was like, I don't know if this is the best place to try right now. 
So this happened a couple of weeks ago or maybe last month with a student is I had someone start and vow with me. And then instantly, as soon as I got through like the subjective, it was way more complicated than I think the student was ready for. It was like multiple pieces to a surgery. There was complications. There was neurological stuff going on. Like it was a really involved surgery. And I was like, I'm going to take the reins on this one. We'll talk about <laughs> it. I mean, the next one you can grab. Because like if I had let that person just swim, like it would have been way too overwhelming for them. And I think the, the patient would have been like, ah, what's going on here? But it was really, really complicated. It was like a very complicated shoulder situation. So I would just say, gauge where the student's at in terms of what they can probably handle and talk with them before. And then maybe if things are falling apart in front of you, because it's really hard, then maybe help them out a little bit more and then come back around. I, I like that, Dave, too. Like put the patient, uh, the students in a position to succeed, right? Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think that's an important thing. If, if, if you're, it's okay to challenge them to get through their comfort level a little bit, but once they, you know, like you might say, give them a little independence, but once, once they start flailing a little bit, that's, you know, where you got to throw a, you know, life raft in there to help. But um, what do you think, Dan? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think Champion's a little bit different because we have a kind of a group um, collaborative effort to try to help students along. It's not like one student, one CI, you follow all their patient caseload. It's a little different than other places. But one of the things that I found that was really helpful, I still try to do this somewhat, but it's a little more challenging, is to ask students what their goals are from the get-go, you know, because oftentimes students are coming to champion for a specific reason. And if it is their final rotation, usually that's a student's chance to go to the clinic they want to go to. And usually they're trying to get something more specific out of that experience. And obviously as clinicians, we have expectations. So we wanna make sure that we get through the whole process of educating students and make sure they become ready to see a patient. I think the other thing that's really helpful is to ask about the goals for the student at the start come up with a way to try to hit those goals. And then periodically throughout the course of their um, stay at champion or whatever, you know, your clinic is at, we see if they're hitting those goals. And if they aren't, let's try to work towards it, right? If we are great, do you want to try to work towards anything else? So then by the end of the clinical affiliation, you feel like you've worked towards something, you know, that you wanted at the start. I like that. And then if, if your clinical rotation has something like an in-service or something like that, you can tie that into that and make sure it's something that they're, you know, really in, in involved with and interested in. I think that's great. Um, Dwesh, I mean, you're, you kind of help coordinate our strength and conditioning interns, right? Which is different than a PT clinical intern, but we do have some of them that are doing it as a requirement for their degree and also some that are doing it for education, you know, any advice for somebody just, you know, as, as an internship leader, you do a lot of education for them. Any advice for somebody just getting started as like a coordinator of that sort of thing? Yeah, I think the, the first thing for me is like, you, you really have to be invested in the role. Like you, you got to really be ready to like give your efforts and, and your time and energy into it. Um, and the, the big one, at least for my situation specific to, to champion um, is kind of along what Dan said about making sure you kind of know what their goals are, right? Because we do get someone from, you know, who's a senior in their undergrad that is trying to figure out their career path or someone who's, you know, already got their master's in strength conditioning and wants to get a little bit more fine tuned or refine into, you know, some of these skill sets. Or we get, you know, PTs that are currently practicing that want to get an understanding of the strength conditioning realm of things and like learn how to, you know, load and progress and regress and stuff like that. So really, you do, you do really have to kind of cater to what they need and what they, you know, maybe want to get out of the situation. So understanding that and, you know, building that relationship um, first is definitely going to go a long way. Now, on top of that, again, I, I like to plan to succeed. Um, so I have a pretty well laid out, like full curriculum that they, that they follow. We do, you know, like an on-ramp week where the first week of their internship will do an in-service every single day to get, you know, familiar with topics or, you know, at least some of our systems so they can be not deer in headlights when they're in the facility, um, right away. So they have something to, to base some of their like visuals off of at least something to like gain an understanding of why is this happening in a certain way? Or, you know, what's the reasoning behind something might even start this way. Um, and then after that, we do like a weekly in-service to cover each topic that might, you know, require a little bit more in-depth stuff or that might build on, on each other. Um, and then other weekly readings and, you know, like con ed stuff to go along with it that they do at home. So kind of, again, like goes to show like it, it does require quite a bit of investment and you do have to be all in on that role of, you know, trying to be an educator and a mentor. So that's kind of the advice that I would give, just like be in it. Yeah, I like that. And I like, you know, um, you know, I know places that do like weekly in services and have like set times and stuff like that. And I also know places where that's un, 
realistic. Like they, it's just hard for them to do that. But, you know, I think we do do that at champion, which is pretty good. You know, we have a lot of like outside reading that we try to like guide them through to like, you know, here's something you should watch or here's something you should read to kind of evolve you through there. But, you know, I think the only thing I would add is you guys had some great input with all this. I think the only thing I would add is remember, we always talk about this framework, you know, so, uh, you know, and you guys, everybody on this zoom call sick of hearing me, but hopefully, you know, you guys listen in a little bit different, but again, your development, knowledge, skill, experience, judgment, right? So I think I want you to get tons of experience at champion. I want you to leave champion with at least the things that we see a lot of with a, some self-confidence in, and experience in certain things. So I, I use that framework all the time of I do, we do, you do, right? I do that all the time. Like you observe me doing it, then we'll do it together. And then you do it with me observing you. And then, you know, you get your reps and get your independence in there. And it's really fun to see the students do that. And I think sometimes the students, you know, you get tired, right? You're doing a lot of like the manual labor throughout the day, but it's super designed that way because at the end of the day, you're like, man, I did that one manual drill, like probably 600 times in the last 10 weeks, right? So your self-confidence and your ability to do that just went through the roof because it's about repetitions. Right. So, you know, that would be the other thing I, 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 I would suggest. So um, awesome stuff. I mean, I, I think that's some really good feedback if you're just getting started as a clinical instructor. Right. So, you know, hopefully you can take some of that advice and, and start applying it. But, you know, I, I think the biggest thing if you take, you know, what Duesh kind of ended with there is like go in with a plan and you'll be a little bit more likely to succeed. And when in doubt, just take a step back and talk to the students right? Some of the best education for me tends to happen at the end of the day when I'm, when I'm done. And I know I have like an hour before I need to go to wherever I need to go next. And we just sit around and we just talk, right? I get to hear what's on the students' minds and talk a little bit, right? And, you know, with COVID, I think, you know, everyone's been trying to get in and out of work a little bit faster. But um, to me, I think some of that is uh, some of the best time. So keep that in mind too. Maybe some unstructured interaction sometime is important, right? The students just think I like to stay in the clinic and, and work on my putting stroke, which I do, but it's, it's so we can talk and I can hear them think a little bit because it's about developing some of those skills. So um, awesome. So great job. I appreciate it, Michael. Thank you for the question. If you have something like that, head to MikeArnold.com, click on that podcast link, and we will answer it in a future episode. Please head to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, rate, review, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks again.